it is. <coughs> I'd like to call to order the Twin Falls City Council meeting for Monday, October 3rd. Uh, those of you wishing to join me, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do have a quorum of the council this evening. Uh, six members are here this evening. Uh, Councilwoman Nikki Boyd uh, is running a little late, and she will join us soon. Uh, Mr. Rothweiler, are there any amendments to the agenda this evening? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, there are no amendments this evening. Thank you, sir. Uh, we do have a couple of proclamations this evening. I'll start off with a proclamation for Xavier Charter Schools Day. Whereas Xavier Charter Schools was granted Idaho Charter School status on December 15, 2006, as the first independent charter serving Twin Falls and surrounding Magic Valley communities, and whereas Xavier Charter Schools has provided a classical education model based on the trivium to students in the Magic Valley for the last 10 years, and whereas Xavier Charter School's primary mission has been to nurture its students in virtue, thus preparing them for every duty of life through recognition of the good, the beautiful, and the true, and whereas Xavier Charter Schools has committed to carrying forth the Founding Fathers' hope that American schools teach students how to preserve a constitutional republic, and whereas Xavier Charter Schools has participated in community service that reflects responsible citizenship in a democratic society, and whereas Xavier Charter Schools began with 267 students, but today has 683 students enrolled and has graduated 83 students since 2008, and whereas other charter schools in Idaho have struggled financially to stay open due to inequities of facility funding, Xavier Charter Schools has attained financial stability with plans for expansion. And whereas Xavier Charter School students have tested in the top 15% on the SAT, now therefore be it resolved that I, Mayor Sean Berger, do hereby proclaim December 15, 2016 as Xavier Charter Schools Day and call upon the citizens of the City of Twin Falls to honor Xavier Charter Schools for its success and service to the people of Twin Falls for the last 10 years. And here to accept this this evening is John Capillaris. Mayor and Council, I'm John Capillaris, and when I first heard about Xavier Charter School, I was living outside of the D.C. area in Waldorf, Maryland. It was 2011. At the turn of the decade, the classical charter school had struggled and faced closure. Luckily, I am able to tell you this story as the chairperson of the Board of Directors in 2016. Uh, the 15th of December, 2006, was when our charter was granted. Uh, we've come a long way since then, uh, when Xavier was a small school located on North College where the Plasma Center currently stands. This story is not yet finished. We have much work ahead of us. Xavier Charter School is an important asset to the Magic Valley. I would like to point out two ways in which we are an important asset. First, we are one of the very few classical schools in the state and in the western United States we provide a true alternative choice to parents and educators. Second, we help alleviate the overcrowding of the Twin Falls School District, uh, providing a lighter tax burden on the local property owners. Xavier Charter Schools provides the trivium, or the three ways. This method of education was spelled out most clearly by Quintilian during the first century AD. Uh, the three ways are grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and corresponding directly to our grammar school, logic school, and rhetoric school. Uh, it culminates ultimately in civic virtue. In our philosophy statement, we say, No nobler training exists but that which cherishes the good, the beautiful, and the true, thus producing disciples of knowledge and lovers of wisdom. 
Contrary to popular belief, char charter schools in Idaho do not get the same amount of money for facility funding as traditional public schools. Idaho charter schools receive uh, similar amounts of money from the state but cannot partake in local levies, which provides so much in the way of <coughs> facility funding. Uh, charters must take what they get and not throw a fit. Many charters have closed due to this fiscal environment. Some must fundraise every year simply to pay for operating expenses. At Xavier Charter School, we have such great demand for students to come to our school, we must expand. Uh, though we have been good stewards of our finances, we need to expand and eventually replicate in order to meet the need. Enrollment is up and we are busting at the seams and have a waiting list large enough to start another school. In order to expand and replicate, we must begin a capital campaign because we cannot raise a levy like the Twin Falls School District can. I am sure this move will prove difficult, but these are good problems to have. Uh, we, uh, if we are successful, it will provide uh, parents with a viable choice and ease the burden on the Twin Falls School District's overcrowding and therefore ease the burden on the property owners who will have to fund any new levies, thus meeting the Twin Falls City uh, strategic <coughs> plan of being an education community. Uh, thank you for supporting and proclaiming our decennial. Uh, we hope to do this again in another 10 years. Thank you, John. And then we have another proclamation, uh, Baby Safe Haven Awareness Day. Whereas the goal of National Baby Safe Haven Awareness Day is to prevent the deaths of newborn infants and to provide parents with a responsible safe mechanism to relinquish a newborn, and whereas parents who relinquish their infants can now leave them in the care of hospitals, physician offices, clinics, medical personnel responding to 911 calls, nurses, and physician assistants without facing prosecution if the child is dropped off within 30 days of birth, and whereas the Infant Abandonment Act was signed into law on July 1st, 2001 in the state of Idaho, and whereas safe haven programs have been started in all 50 states and the District of Columbia to promote awareness and to ensure that all birth mothers are given all their options, and whereas many local safe haven programs have combined efforts with the National Safe Haven Alliance in further efforts to prevent infanticide and unsafe newborn abandonment through safe haven rel relinquishments. Now, therefore, I, Sean Berger, Mayor of Twin Falls, Idaho, do hereby proclaim the day Monday, October 3rd, 2016, to be Baby Safe Haven Awareness Day in the city of Twin Falls, Idaho, and I call upon the residents of this city to join with me to encourage all citizens to work together to promote an increased awareness and understanding of this important initiative. And do we have someone from the CSI paramedic program? There you are. This is McKinsey. We're second semester paramedic students at the College of Southern Idaho. During the first semester, we were required to do a community outreach project. Um, we noticed that since uh, Angel Rose was found, there had been no safe haven awareness in our community or even in our state for a long time. So we decided to do a safe haven PSA. We got a lot of support from some news, a news agencies to help us put a video together. We thought we were just going to put this little video together and put it on Facebook and that's all it was going to be and it turned, up, it turned out even, even bigger than we can imagine. We did a awareness day and we got support from the entire community, fire, law enforcement, uh, Twin Falls City, Twin Falls County, the hospital, Match Valley Paramedics. There was so many people there. Then we received a phone call from um, Timothy Jacquard, who is the founder of Safe Haven, um, and he called us congratulating us on what we did and has supported us through the entire through the entire situation. So, with getting recognition from Timothy Jacquard, um, he has actually uh, donated signs to be placed on fire departments, paramedic stations, hospitals, um, basically anywhere that you can actually hand your baby over and have a safe haven place. So what we're showing you guys today um, is that these will be the signs set out um, 
in front of the buildings um, that I have named. One, they're um, just explaining that they're a safe haven place, um, you know, that we recommend that if nobody is there, that it has a phone number to be given, um, you know, stating what the actual act is um, in English and in Spanish as well, um, you know, for our community. So not only are we giving this awareness um, out to people, but it doesn't stop there. The signs are going to be put on the buildings to forever be stand there. So with that in mind, we thank you guys for all your support. Great. And thank you very like much. To present these signs to um, Twin Falls City and Twin Falls Fire that are here today. This is for you guys. Uh, you know, we will be having a You bet. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the uh, on the agenda, uh, next is general public input. If I could get somebody from staff to check the sign-up sheet for me, please. Uh, so signed up to address the council, we have uh, Lee Stranahan. Welcome, Lee. If you could please state your name and address, and if you would please limit your comments to three minutes, we'd appreciate it. Sure. My name is Lee Stranahan. I live in Twin Falls. And uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. Uh, last week I talked about downtown development a little bit, and I'd like to continue on that theme. Last week I mentioned the importance, I think, of getting some sort of sense of what anchor businesses, businesses that would draw people to the downtown area uh, should be considered. Uh, what I'd like to talk about this week and urge you to uh, strongly consider is that as I've, I've looked into the issue of downtown development a little bit, and I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know here probably, uh, there are a number of different interests at work here. For instance, there's the people who are downtown currently, the business owners, there's the property owners, a number of whom are absentee owners. A lot of the buildings downtown are owned by people who are not in Twin Falls currently. You've got the historical society. You've got the downtown redevelopment project. You've got other businesses in the area. Uh, at the development meeting that uh, Mr. Rothweiler uh, did a presentation at a couple of weeks ago, some of the business owners who aren't in downtown expressed some concerns about the area. So here's what I'm suggesting practically. I think what's needed at this point, and this has been, this has been suggested by other people, but I, I just want to lay out a couple of parameters I think are important, is you need a sort of come to Jesus meeting where, you know, I'm using it, not literally, but I'm, you know, you need a meeting where everybody gets together and people can express their concerns. And I think getting public input on this is also important. Some people at a historical society meeting, this came up a couple weeks ago, they were saying, well, we don't know if we want input from these people. I think what you need initially is something where everybody can come in and in an honest atmosphere, not trying to solve every problem at that one meeting. But people can say, this is what I'm concerned about. This is what I'm concerned about. And at least we can lay those out on the table at first. <coughs> I think that's a good first step to starting to solve it because there, but there are practical problems that definitely involves certain things that the city council and the city manager are going to have to deal with, for instance, zoning concerns, issues about building code that are keeping certain development from happening down there without getting into the weeds. That's the kind of general stuff I'm talking about. Um, and I think that it's about time to, especially with the investment, and the reason I'm suggesting this now is because you've obviously, you've obviously, 
you're, you're into this already, right? The, the project is well underway. So I think it's a good time to start to talk about what comes next after the city hall is up, after the work on Maine is done, that's going to happen and everything. And so that's one thing I would just like you to consider. Is it about time to start laying out what the situation is, bringing everybody together, and then moving forward together to try to get some solutions for the problems that come up there? Thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Shanahan. Lee. Greg Lansing. Lee. Just as, I, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that your idea isn't an excellent one, and we probably should do, especially after we get the uh, new city hall and things there. But I probably personally myself have a dozen, a ten, a ten similar meetings over the last 15 years about downtown, where we brought in all the stakeholders, brought in the public, met right here in this room, had good crowds at times too, and so it's not something that has been, not been occurring. But I, I do agree with you. After the new city hall, it's possible that another one would be a good idea. I just wanted to, didn't want you to think that they hadn't been occurring because they have been. I appreciate you clarifying. Just just so you know, I am aware of that, and I'm also aware okay. that it's obviously a complex issue. And that's like I say that the, what I'm I'm aware that there's been stuff in the past, and what I'm suggesting is you're probably going to need a series of meetings one or two, because it's a tangle, right? There's a lot of conflicting interests and everybody's got an opinion. And so you're probably going to need one or two meetings just to get on the record for everybody what the actual problems are. And then solving them is going to be, you know, it's going to go in ten different directions. But I agree with you. My, what's the schedule in the City Hall? I forget what, what the specific schedule in City Hall being up November 17, I believe. Yeah, so we will go out to bid in November of 16, and we estimate there will be somewhere between a 10- to 12-month construction, and so uh, at the latest we'll be in in November of 2017. So the only, the only thing I would say, just, just to respond to your point and appreciate you making it, is that um, because of some of the other work that's going on now, there might be, you know, and again, I'm not, an, I'm not a meeting person, right? <laughs> I'm not an endless meeting person. So... I, I think your concern is uh, for not having too many meetings is well-founded. But with the work that I know is going to be going on there soon, for instance, they're about to start ripping up Maine to, put, to do work on sewage and other stuff in there, great. I think it's a good time, I think sooner or better, to at least lay out some of the concerns. So I appreciate you saying that, but that's my suggestion. Okay. Anything else? I, I appreciate it, Mr. Landing. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Shanahan. So that's the only person who had signed up. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the council on any item this evening? Seeing no one, we will move on with the balance of our agenda. Uh, first up is the consent calendar. Council wishes. Move to approve. <clears throat> Second. The motion by Chris Talkington, seconded by Suzanne Hawkins, to approve the consent calendar. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Suzanne Hawkins. Yes. Sean Berriger. Yes. Chris Talkington. Yes. Greg Lanting. Yes. Don Hall. Yes. Ruth Pierce. Yes. Motion passes 6 to 0. Under items for consideration, uh, the first is the Twin Falls Fire Department would like to recognize the achievements of firefighter Jared Sauer, who has completed his firefighter at level 1 certification, and we have Ron Aguirre. Welcome, Ron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. My name is Ron Aguirre, and on behalf of the Twin Falls Fire Department, I would like to thank you for your support in recognizing Firefighter Jared Sauer for his recent accomplishment of achieving his Firefighter Level 1. Jared Sauer. Jared Sauer was born and raised in Jerome, Idaho. He graduated from Jerome High School and attended CSI for two years. In 2008, he was hired by the U.S. Forest Service and worked as a wildland firefighter until the spring of 2015. <coughs> Jared is happily married to his wife, Sarah, and they have two boys, Weston and Brody. Jared joined the Twin Falls City Fire Department on August 3, 2015, and recently completed his Firefighter Level 1 program. Firefighter 1 consists of classes and practical exercises that include the incident command system, hazardous materials, 
awareness, extrication awareness, and CPR. In total, Jared has completed over 360 hours of fire service training and an additional 155 hours of spe special operations training. Once all the coursework and practical exercises are completed, a recruit is given a final practical and written exam in which the recruit must score an 80% or higher. I'm happy to announce that Jared has performed extremely well over the past year and has demonstrated the skill and ability to receive his Twin Falls Fire Department Firefighter 1 certification. Jared, congratulations on this accomplishment. You are no longer a recruit firefighter. Today, we are proud to call you a professional Twin Falls firefighter. On behalf of the Fire Department Administration, we would, like, we would also like to thank the members of the department that helped Jared over the past year, including members of the training office and team members on his engine company. At this time, I would invite Mayor Berger to present Jared with his Firefighter One certificate and his new helmet shield. <laughs> Jared, congratulations and thank you to uh, all of our firefighters for their professionalism and service in the community. Next on the agenda is a request to adopt the collective bargaining agreement between the City of Twin Falls and Twin Falls Firefighters Local 1556. And we have Susan Harris, our Human Resources Director. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. And before we get on to our agenda item, I'll apologize because it was me who took the sign-up sheet last week <laughs> inadvertently. So Sharon, I apologize. <laughs> was in with some enrollment materials and it just got picked up. and. I didn't catch it until after your meeting, so I apologize for that. But um, I am pleased to be here this evening to um, present to you the draft copy of the collective bargaining agreement. This agreement is between the City of Twin Falls and the Twin Falls Firefighters Local 1556. As my staff report indicated, um, members of the executive team with the local who consist of Dave Owens, Gerald, Gerald Dillman, and Jesse Bowman met with um, city administration, and we've been meeting the last few months to go over um, just information, share information about salary and benefits that were coming into play beginning October 1st, as well as go over some items that they had wanted to discuss. At the conclusion of these meetings, we have primarily just three changes to bring forward in the, the draft. The first one is changing the contract from a two-year, as it's been in past years, to a one-year agreement. This allows the new chief to come into a, um, the organization, gives him a time to become familiar with the department, and it allows the firefighters to um, open up the negotiations <coughs> again at the conclusion of that year. The second change um, can be found on page 10. It is in reference to section 22, which is manning of companies. Uh, the expanded language that you'll see in the contract just um, clearly identifies kind of the makeup of the shift that um, is recommended. It also allows for a four hour period of time so that the manning can drop below the, the manning requirements in the event of an emergency situation gives flexibility to the command staff of the fire uh, department as well as to individuals who may have an unforeseen emergency and they need to leave. So um, that language is in there to help both parties. The last change is um, just some language that's been added to the appeal process under discipline. It's in Appendix B of the draft and it just provides an opportunity um, for both parties to come together to have a discussion of the issue at hand prior to requiring mediation and binding arbitration. So 
um, both parties were in agreement with this when it was put together. And Dave, do you want to come up and say something now? Okay. I'm Dave Owens, uh, president of Twin Falls Firefighters Local 1556. I just wanted to stand up here and publicly thank uh, Travis and Brian and Susan for working with us doing, during the um, collective bargaining agreement. Uh, this is my first time actually working with the city and going through um, all the negotiations, and it was, it was incredible. It was, they did a great job working with us, keeping the communication open, and I just wanted to publicly say thank you. So that's it. Don Hall. Susan, um, under the manning of companies, it looks like, and maybe I just missed it in your presentation, um, that there's really no change because it was 11 before, excluding the battalion chief. Now it's 12, mm. including the, so it's just a, a language it's, change? It's just, I think, um, kind of a de more detailed explanation of how it will work. Okay. So the numbers haven't really changed, just kind of a... Um, explanation of the the positions. Thank you. Chris Dockington. I'd just like to relate during my experience with the city that um, our uh, meaning management relationship with the uh, firefighter union members and uh, management staff has been most exemplary. I would put Twin Falls relationship with this fire crew up against any that I'm aware of certainly in Idaho and probably far beyond its boundaries. And I think that uh, is uh, because of several reasons. One, there has been a lot of trust engendered going both ways. We have a flat organization, and we know what our mission is, and uh, uh, sometimes we uh, uh, perhaps work a little bit too hard in one area and uh, forget about some other areas, but we come back and keep our eye on, on the, the mission. I'm really proud of our relationship we have with the Fire Department, thank you all, and let's uh, keep that trust at the level that it has uh, maintained for years. Ditto. Ruth Pierce. Are you ready for a motion, Sean? I am. I would make a motion that we adopt the collective bargaining agreement for the period October 1, 2016 to September 30, 2017. The agreement is between the City of Twin Falls and the Twin Falls Firefighters Local. 1556. Second. Motion by Ruth Kerr, seconded by Don Hall to adopt the collective bargaining agreement as presented. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Sean Berger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Motion passes 6-0. Thank, Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much. Travis? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, just a couple of quick things. I think that we would echo Dave's comments in terms of the overall partnership. Um, the relationship that we have with 1556 is, is probably second to none and something that we always appreciate. There are, I guess to kind of put it for a council awareness, there are two issues um, that are not resolved, and we agreed to bring the agreement forward, and the main reason the two issues aren't resolved right now because we're waiting for our new chief to come, and we really wanted his input. One of them you'll see shortly, I believe, is going to be a, a memorandum of understanding between the city and the local to adjust hours of work. So right now they're on a 24-48 schedule, and lots of companies are moving to a 48-96 schedule. But before we included that in here and made a whole bunch of changes to SOPs, we wanted to get the new chief involved, and so we wanted to let you know that we continue to work on that, as well as other areas, especially in the areas of, of compensation and making sure that those remain equitable and fair across the board. And our commitment to the fire uh, local is no different than we have in any other uh, part of our organization. Thank you, Travis. Next item on the agenda is a request to approve an agreement for design, bidding, and construction engineering services with JUB Engineers for the 2017 FAA taxiway construction and fire truck acquisition <laughs> projects. Bill Carberry, our airport manager. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome, Bill. The evil clowns are out of here. 
don't say that. <laughs> yeah. Good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, I have three projects uh, to talk about tonight and two contracts. The first one here tonight is the uh, Taxiway Alpha reconstruction and rehabilitation and the uh, bidding and acquisition uh, of a fire truck. Um, Taxiway Alpha from the midpoint of the airfield here at Connector Alpha 3 down. This is Alpha 2 and then here's Alpha 1. Um, this section is uh, due to be rehabilitated. Uh, it's been since I think the early 80s. We've done some crack seal and seal coat maintenance, but um, we're looking here to rehabilitate that and couple that with another high priority project, which is the acquisition of a replacement fire truck uh, for the 1996 model that we have. Uh, when engineering contracts uh, are in excess of uh, $100,000, and this contract is uh, $621,000, and as soon as I get to it here, I'll, I'll fill in the other numbers, but uh, it's well over $100,000. We're required to do an independent fee estimate uh, with another engineering firm that has familiarity with these types of projects, and that's an FAA requirement. All of the projects tonight are FAA projects. So we enlisted uh, for a small fee um, the services of CH2M Hills uh, Aviation Division to look at the scope of work. Uh, go over man hours, costs, uh, expenses, those types of things, consultants to come up with an independent fee estimate. JUB contract uh, came up at $621,537, and the CH2M, CH2M engineer's contract was $631,798. So they were extremely close. They were about 2%. JUB was slightly under the CH2M, and uh, that's really, the, in all of my years, that's the first time something's come in so close. So. Perhaps it was a compliment to a well-written scope. Um, the FAA considers anything within 10 or 15 percent of each other to be fairly close uh, in, in your negotiation. Um, construction costs for the project are estimated at about $2.7 million for the taxiway rehabilitation, and the fire truck could be upwards of uh, $750,000 roughly for that. We've been working with the FAA for several years. When you couple um, two high-priority projects together like this, you improve your chances of receiving what they call discretionary funding. Um, so with this, we're looking at a substantial discretionary funding from the FAA in the amount of approximately $2.9 million, in addition to our million-dollar uh, annual entitlement to uh, cover these projects. So we're looking to have the, the taxiway project bid in the spring, so uh, JUB will be very busy through the fall and winter shaping up this bid packet to get an April uh, bid opening. Um, bid awards um, are um, um, presented uh, when we have open bids. The grants are based on open bids, and we're hoping to do that this spring. The local match of 6.25% of cost is in our budget, uh, and we'll be covering that through our PFC funds that we collect through the airlines. So we'll be um, providing the match that way. So with that, um, I'll stand for any questions and recommend the City Council approve the agreement for engineering <coughs> services with JUB Engineering in the amount of $621,537.56, uh, contingent upon FAA concurrence and funding. Thank you, Bill. Chris Talkington. I want to uh, acquaint the council with the fact I think uh, not the first item but the second, the fire truck, Travis, is, and Bill, is that not paid with impact fees for a local share? Is FAA eligible? Yeah. Yeah. That would be FAA eligible. Yeah, it, it's that piece of safety equipment, yeah. So no impact fees. Correct. Enough. Okay, thank you. Greg Lanting. Again, on the fire truck, Bill, is there a chance we can piggyback on some other city or airport in our area or our state that has recently uh, replaced a fire truck? We've done that with a snow plow. Um, with the FAA project manager I'm looking at right now, he tends to like competitive bidding processes. Okay. But we'll explore that with them if it's a like for like, if we could piggyback, and if there are others within Idaho, that could be a possibility. I guess we could always go out for bid and then reject them and do the piggyback <laughs> if it's better. <laughs> Chris Talkington. I'll move uh, 
city uh, approved the engineering uh, service for JUB in the amount of six twenty one six hundred twenty one thousand five hundred thirty seven dollars fifty six cents contingent upon FAA concurrence and funding. Second. Motion by Chris Dockington, seconded by Ruth Pierce to uh, approve the agreement for design, bidding, and construction engineering services as presented. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Sean Barriger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Now present and yes. <laughs> <laughs> Motion passes 7 to 0. <coughs> Excuse me. Next on the agenda, we have a request to approve the Northeast Taxi Lane Preliminary Design Contract with JUB Engineers in the amount of $89,829.16. And again, Bill Carberry, Airport Manager. Thank you, Sean. Um, <coughs> when I was here in, uh, gosh, it must have been March when we looked at the FedEx project, and this Google Earth image shows really the foundation being laid there. Uh, for the FedEx facility. Um, we talked about um, having a future project to try to define how we would bring a new taxi lane in and what its configuration would look like, what types of impacts and opportunities that may present. Um, so we've been working with the FAA and we've included this preliminary design project in the airport budget for, for 2017. And we'd like to kick that off soon. To start to give us an idea, as we it really fits together with this rehabilitation of this taxiway. We'll start to look at grades of where we can tie in and come down. And there are, it's a pretty good grade down the hill here. But then tie in here and will it, will it be here? Will it be here? What will it look like? So um, there's uh, certainly a, a lot of interest from tenants on the airport that they'd like to be part of this process. The pre-design project that we have here tonight will include public involvement. The board will have open meetings. There'll be a series of meetings, uh, much like any planning project, where we'll sort of throw it all on the table first and then come back with a few alternatives, and the board will select a preferred alternative to recommend to the city and the county uh, as we move forward. So we, we look to see this project span from the fall into the springtime period uh, to try to come up with a preferred alternative uh, to recommend to the city and county to move forward on that and then look for forward fund for, for funding in the, in the near future from the FAA to build that. So through this pre-design, it's really important that, you know, one of the, the key parameters is that it's, it's, uh, it's a fundable project, a constructible project uh, that the FAA will, will support. So um, they are in support of us uh, looking at this, uh, doing this pre-design exercise that will fold right into design and then ultimately construction. Uh, the contract is for below 100000 It's 89829 16 um, will be reimbursed from the FAA in the 2018 fiscal cycle. So we forward funded this into 17 with uh, anticipating a grant reimbursement in 2018. Um, so with that, I'd like to stand for any questions, but I'd recommend the council approve the agreement for the Northeast preliminary design with JUB for the amount of 89829 contingent upon FAA concurrence and funding. Boy. Bill, do, have you had people reaching out to you, tenants that are already out there and, and, and they understand that they're going to be involved? And I just want to make sure there's really good dialogue yeah, we, out we, there. Yeah, we've, we've communicated that to the tenants out there. They know that they'll be part of this process. They'll be, get personal invitations to come to these. We'll let them know well in advance so they can uh, prepare to be there and, be, and participate. Fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you. Suzanne Hawkins. Are you ready for a motion? I am ready for a motion. I would move that we uh, approve the Northeast Taxi Lane preliminary design contract with JUB Engineers in the amount of $89,829.16. Contingent. Yeah, contingent upon FAA concurrence and funding. Okay. Second. Motion by Suzanne Hawkins, seconded by Greg Lanting, to approve the uh, preliminary design contract as presented. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. 
Thank you, Thank Council. You, Bill. Next is a request to award a GSA contract to purchase a sewer jet truck. We have John Caton, oh, our public works stuff. director. Welcome, John. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you. Yes, tonight um, I have uh, a GSA contract to uh, procure a sewer jet and um, if you re recall, a couple of weeks ago, we rejected bids. We were going to go out to bid. I was able to find a GSA contract that we could pay you back. Um, and so that's what you have before you. If there's any questions. Greg Lanting. I move approval of the, the request to award a GSA contract to purchase a sewer jet truck. Second. Motion by Greg Lanting, seconded by Don Hall, to award the GSA contract as presented. Chris Talkington. No, we need to make a mention of the vendor in the motion and the amount. Maryland Industrial Trucking. Let's do that. Maryland Industrial Trucking. What's the amount? One seven. Are you asking me? Sure. One hundred and seventy-eight thousand two hundred fifty-six and twenty-nine cents. That. Seventy thousand two fifty-six and twenty. Twenty-nine cents. Twenty-nine cents. So it'd be included in my motion with the with the permission of my second. I think that would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. All right. So the, so the motion is to award the GSA contract to purchase a sewer jet truck from Maryland Industrial Trucking Incorporated in the amount of one hundred seventy-eight thousand two hundred fifty-six dollars and twenty-nine cents. Suzanne Hawkins. Thank you. John, I'm sorry if I'm slow, but can you remind me what is GSA? It's the General Services Administration, and it's, a, it's an independent agency at the federal government level, and they, they procure goods and services for government agencies. Thank you. Any further discussion? Sharon, roll call vote, please. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berger? Yes. Chris Hawkins? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Next is a request to approve using $300,000 from street reserves to fund a mill and inlay and ADA ramps on Falls Avenue. John Caton. Thank you. So I just wanted to talk about um, pavement prices right now. And today, uh, Josh Baird was able, in engineering, was able to put together some information for, for this presentation just to illustrate the, the good advantage we're getting uh, due to the oil prices being where they're at. Um, you can see this, this chart here I have in front of you goes back to 2010. Um, I don't have a lot of data in 2010, 11, and 12. You see in 13, there's several data points, and those prices are um, price per ton in place. So, for example, you see in 2013 the anomaly, a real high number, $142, almost $143 uh, per ton. Um, that one's high. There's a couple things going on here. Also, that was a real small quantity job, so you don't get quite the price advantage when you get the small quantity. So that's why you see such a spread from 93 all the way up to 142 um, in, in 2013. Um, jumping ahead to 2015, it's $102 and $108. And um, the difference between last year and this year alone is 25%. So right now, we have projects that we've bid that are at $81.25 per ton in place. It, as you, if you look left it's the lowest price we can see in the last five six years um, it's a good price and so last week we started talking about this good price and we started talking about what the upcoming zone maintenance projects are going to be and um, Falls Avenue is is the one I wanted to talk about tonight and, and in our zone maintenance program and long-term planning 
we wanted to mill and overlay Falls Avenue from Washington to Blue Lakes, a whole mile. Two lanes on the north side, two lanes on the south side. And that's, that's too much money in, one, in a single year to do that. So we wanted to do half of it this year and half of it next year. Um, but what I'd like to propose is that um, because of this, this pricing is to accelerate the project and use reserves to mill and overlay the north half now and, and then next, next summer we'll use our budget to mill the south half. And just to point out, part of the reason I'm not asking for all of it right now is because I have some water line work to do. So I would be asking for to mill and do the whole thing because I think the price is so good. But this is Blue Lakes. This is Falls. There's Frontier right here. Just did the ADA ramps there. But if you remember in front of Subaru, we have several water line failures right along here and some patches. And I, sim I simply can't get out there and do the underground in time before the weather turns off and we can't, we can't get it paved. Mm -hmm. So we need to hold off on this southern side of Falls for next year. Um, so, can I ask a question yeah. on that? Uh, uh, then, John, will there, with the difference of the mill overlay just on the north side, will that represent any sort of a, uh, a driver's problem? Is there going to be a physical um, mm -hmm. variation in the uh, asphalt height uh, construct, uh, constitute a danger? No, we'll match the existing centerline crown. Feather and, and, it out. Yeah, in fact, in a lot of the center lane, in my opinion, is in good enough condition to leave as is, so we'll leave it. There's some turning lanes and there's some intersections that it's not, so we'll just be, we'll I match see. existing though. Okay. Greg uh, Lansing. John, was that what, I went through falls today and it looked like quite a few of our guys were out there trying to get run over, trying to mark things. Is that what they were doing? Probably, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they probably were locating utilities. Yeah. And yeah. actually, the north side has some gate valves in it, and when you bring a mill in and you're rototilling up pavement, you can't, you gotta, you gotta move those, some of those lids, so they might be doing that. Um, they were marking. They were marking. <clears throat> okay, so um, we asked uh, Idaho Materials Construction, we publicly bid a, a, a mill and inlay project, and um, that was the $81 per ton. We asked uh, if they'd be willing to piggyback that price, and they are, and that's the, the bid that you have in your package. For 232811 On top of that, any time, is there any questions? Okay. Um, You know, anytime we do a mill and inlay, we're required by the federal government to improve the ADA ramps. And on the north side, we have, um, you can see, about 10, 10 different uh, ramps that we need to improve. And the, pri the price on the north side alone is $65,000. Um, so, um, I would, I, before I get into what I, I'm asking council, I guess I'd like to point out what the south side ADA ramps look like for next year. And there's a lot more down on the south side. So keep in mind, if we got the same price next year to mill the south side, let's say it's 235,000, it's gonna cost us more to do the ADA ramps than it is the whole, the whole south side. So um, anyway, that's an issue for another day. I just wanted to point out the cost of ADA ramps. Suzanne Hawkins. Sorry, I know it's not relevant, but I'm just curious. What's the difference between the Type One and Type Three ADA ramps? I, ITD has standard types. I don't have them all memorized in my head. I'm so glad. It, it, <laughs> it depends on the configuration of what you're looking at. Whether it's okay. like a double ramp or a single. I don't. I don't remember. That's okay. I was just curious. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I guess um, in closing, staff would like to request about $300,000 from street reserves to fund the mill and inlay and the ADA project for the north side of Falls from Blue Lakes to Washington. 
Chris Talkington. Well, any time we can save $66,000 by <clears throat> taking advantage of our lower costs, I think we'd be uh, irresponsible not to take advantage of it. That being said, I would uh, move to use 300000 from street reserves to fund the mill overlay inlay and ADA, ADA ramps on Falls Avenue. Second. A motion by Chris Toggenton, seconded by Nikki Boyd to approve the use of $300,000 from street reserves for the mill and inlay and ADA ramp project as presented. Nikki, did you have another comment to make? Or? I did not. Okay. Is there any discussion from council? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Don Hall? Yes. <clears throat> Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Thank you, John. What's the timeline on that? They're marking stuff today. Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, you know, I, first Completion. Of all, I, yeah, first of all, I need to sign a contract with them and, and communicate with Idaho Materials. It's my understanding that they're going to close their hot plant um, towards the end of November, so it's going to happen between now, now and then. Okay, this year then. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but even if for some reason uh, cold weather, bad weather closed in before then, we'd still have that contract at that price that the, would have to be honored? You know, I'm not sure how long that, that I could get him to honor the contract, but I can, that's why. I, I'd make sure it's as long as possible. Yeah. <laughs> 2020. Yeah. Yeah. At least till next year, <laughs> anyway, yeah. for the other half. The, the weather looks like we'll be able to make it. Shouldn't be an issue. Good. Travis, did you have something to add? Yeah, so the reason we're coming to you and asking for cash reserves is because on uh, Saturday was the beginning of the new fiscal year, and John and I had a conversation about looking and, and really trying to project forward and moving forward. Um, the amount of money that you're spending on the project is less than the amount of money that we'll be placing into the street fund cash reserves this year. And so John and, and his team are going to start doing some forward looking about July and August because if we have monies appropriated and then we can take advantages of situations like this, we want to try to do so within the confines of that fiscal year. So I just wanted to explain uh, to the council and also to the public, why are we using reserves? And really, it's a timing issue right now on, on the fiscal year. Um, we will present to you a budget amendment in September of 2017 that will incorporate these funds if it's needed. Uh, if we find ourselves into the same place that we were this year, um, this amendment wouldn't be included because we would have the cash to be able to carry it forward. But this just gives us the authorization in the event that we're able to utilize the funds allocated that you've given us permission to use cash reserves in uh, upcoming years. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Next on the agenda is uh, another opportunity for public input. Is there anyone here from the public who would like to address the council? Seeing none, Mr. Rothweiler. So I'm going to be gone for a couple of days, and um, Mr. Pike is going to be serving as the uh, acting city manager in my absence. And good luck to you in your competition. <laughs> <laughs> Any items from the city council? Don Hall. I just wanted to remind the council that our uh, good mayor has, uh, has accepted the mayor's challenge walking challenge and so if you see him wandering around aimlessly throughout the city of Twin Falls it's not aimless <laughs> he's actually uh, doing it for a good cause as well uh, maybe Sean you could tell us a little bit about the fundraising aspect of what you're trying to do yeah so for, it's the mayor's school walking challenge uh, that kicked off on Saturday actually the official kickoff in Twin Falls is tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock at Sawtooth Elementary and uh, the goal is to raise awareness and activity in uh, young children and uh, those of us terrible role models to get out there and uh, change our ways so that we can be better role models. Fitness is not one of my greatest strengths, so this is going to be a bit of a challenge. But uh, So the opportunity is there is between $1,000 and $6,000 available should I be the mayor of the 25 mayors who walks the most steps in October uh, to go toward uh, school and parks projects. Um, because I don't like to lose, I added rules. So what I did is I've challenged members of the community 
uh, to make a pledge per mile that I walk in October and make a commitment to donate those funds through the Community Foundation uh, to our uh, Magic Valley Trail Enhancement Committee so that even if I come up short on the funds from this project, maybe we can get a few funds together for the trail. So uh, I will be out and about. I have a Facebook page that's set up telling you where I'll be walking and inviting you to come join me. And uh, today I decided I'm going to hit the treadmill because I'm afraid if I went walking I would end up in Burley <laughs> in about three steps. <laughs> so. Don last year did an outstanding job representing our community and I'm not confident I will come close to what he did, but I'll, we'll have a good time doing it. So thank you. Anything else from the council? We are not quite to 6 o'clock yet. We have a public hearing scheduled at 6, so we will uh, take a short recess and reconvene at 6 o'clock. Are we good, Sharon? All right, we will... Uh, Bring back to order the city council meeting for our public hearing. It is uh, 602. And uh, our public hearing this evening is a request for a special use permit to establish an open parking lot on property located at 229 2nd Avenue North, lots 6 through 14, block 85, Twin Falls Town Site for the City of Twin Falls Urban Renewal Agency. We have Nathan Murray, our Economic Development Director. Okay. Thank you. Welcome, Nathan. It's a pleasure to be here. So this property, as you can see, the intersection of Gooding and 2nd Avenue North um, was purchased by the URA with the intention of creating a parking lot, a uh, use that is customary for your downtown in an area that's adjacent to another city lot that uh, at times uh, exceeds capacity during events particularly. Um, we're asking the council to approve two things right now. One, to approve the special use permit to allow this to be a parking lot, and second, to defer the... Um, permanent improvements which are required as uh, part of the de development of the property. Uh, we're asking for that deferral as we're in the middle of our Main Street project and subsequent uh, alleyway improvements. Rather than have to install those now, tear them up at a later date, and then recover again and not have to do that twice, we just uh, prefer to defer if we could. So do you have any questions regarding these requests? Ruth Pierce. So, Nate, um, that parking lot as it is right now, or mm -hmm. excuse me, that piece of property as it is right now, that would be left? The, the yeah, so it's okay. been um, it's, you know, graded and, right. and underground utilities have been in place. We would put, um, I guess, millings over the top uh, to give it some sort of um, just keep dust down and a little more appropriate for parking rather than just the, uh, the base that's there. Okay, thank you. Travis? So we're going to do um, that same um, process that we've done in all of the other parks where we take the mill in LA and then we put that over the top. It acts like a really nice uh, compact surface for a period of time and then like Nate said in 2019 we'll go back through, uh, remove uh, the temporary seal and then the Urban Renewal Agency will turn it into, uh, they'll use uh, the hot mix and turn it into a, a full uh, parking lot. Greg Lanting. Uh, are we going to line it? That will be my first question. Yes, and landscape and lighting. Okay. And then can we go back to the fir very first picture? Or the and I'm just thinking for the future here, maybe for the URA, if something that would, if, if the money was available and the, had a willing seller. Do anybody know who that building right there, have its viability? Because it would be an excellent pass through to Main Street, like we have in some other places in our downtown, that make it those parking lots much more usable. Okay. Especially, I'm thinking for the event center we have right there that has a lot of activity, especially on Friday nights or quinceaneras, if I'm saying that correct. And so, so one of the strategies that the Urban Renewal Agency is looking at is trying to find those connectors from the parking lots. And as you're aware, most of our parking lots are on either side of the seconds. And so that has actually been a property uh, and other places have also been identified as trying to create opportunities to access from the parking lot directly onto Main Avenue as opposed to having to walk 
uh, around. And so that is a strategy the agency is currently looking at. Because I would think it would make that particular block a lot more viable if that had that ability to I'm thinking on the, I'm thinking the, what is that, the northeast side, I guess, of, of Maine. So, and also there's some buildings on the opposite side that are not being fully utilized either. So, Dave, thank you. Chris Toggenton. Nathan, perhaps you know the answer to this. This temporary mill levy, uh, at such time it will be replaced with the permanent overlay. Uh, that can be recycled and the cost recovered on that. Is yes. that correct? Mm -hmm. So we're not doing a one-way throwaway process. Yes. Good. I'm a tree hugger. Okay. Excuse me, I'm an asphalt hugger. <laughs> Any other questions for Nate? Seeing none, we will have the staff report from Jonathan Spendlove. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, Mayor Berger and Council members. Uh, the history of it, it's been zoned CB for at least since the 1980s when that zoning district was established. Various business, uh, United Automotive, United Engine, United Electronics, Muffler Warehouse, and Magic Valley Archery was the last um, business in there. The URA purchased the property, demolished the two buildings, they put the fill material. Um, we are dealing with the CB zoning district, which lists open parking lots as special use permits. So typically that would go to the Planning and Zoning Commission. The reason it's coming to the City Council is the City will be operating that parking lot. We'll be enforcing the hours. And so when a city owns or maintains or operates a land use that's different from what it was before, it comes to the city council for that establishment because we are basically the operators of it as a city. So that's why it's before you. Uh, 10719 um, is the code section that allows that to come to you. The requirements, 1011... It's Title 10, Chapter 11, and Sections 1 through 8. And when there's a change of use of a building structure or a parcel of land, this had a building, now it's going to go to a parking lot, two different land uses. Now, certain improvements to the property are required, most notably hard surface parking areas, parking lot landscaping, lighting, and stormwater management. The URA has expressed that they've got a, the main street and the alleyway projects. They'll be tearing up portions of the property and or utilizing part of it. Um, this is the layout, the interim layout that they have um, how it will be striped after they do the mill and inlay and then uh, like a sealer. Um, they'll be putting in the landscaping um, eventually in these um, cross-hatched areas in the future. So the, lo the parking lot landscaping is a required improvement that they have to do. Um, that would be done at the permanent stage of it. The interim, it would just be striped. Additionally, there will be parking lot lighting, the security lighting for the parking lot. That will then be deferred as well until the permanent um, portions of the project are done, as well as the resurfacing with either Portland like concrete or asphalt, new asphalt or, or concrete. So those are the items they're asking to defer. The stormwater would also have to be done at the later time, and they're looking at incorporating the landscaped areas to take the stormwater, um, similar to what you see in some other locations. So. That's something we've been working with the engineering department on figuring out how to do that. Those items will be taken care of at the permanent phase. So, should the council grant this request, as presented, staff recommends approval be subject to the following conditions. One, subject to the site plan amendments as required by building engineering, fire, and zoning officials to ensure compliance with applicable city code requirements and standards. Number two, subject to all applicable required improvements, such as asphalt, paved parking, maneuvering, landscaping, lighting, stormwater management being installed in conjunction with the completion of the downtown Main Street slash alley project is projected for 2019. That's all. Thank you, Jonathan. Suzanne Hawkins. Jonathan, I don't know if these questions are for you, but we'll start there, okay? okay. So will these all be the three-hour parking, or will some of them be available as other options in our other lots, or how will it be configured? So the actual locations haven't been decided. I'm guessing that will be between the URA and the city. And what I can tell you is there's two options. You have three-hour free and parking pass. Um, if, you, if they deviate from either of those options, we'd either have to amend the code or something else, because those are the two that recognize that we have in the code for the parking options. But we're not sure if, how it's going to be yet. I don't believe a layout has been determined as to which ones would be parking pass and which one would be three hour. Um, if I'm looking at the other lots, uh, most of them have a pretty good mix of a parking pass and three hour, um, especially the ones, the orange lot, which is behind the Orpheum, has a lot of three hour not as much parking pass as the others do. Okay. 
And my next question is, I'm just a little concerned about deferring the lighting for three years. We've had a lot of comments from citizens who feel unsafe walking because of the darkness, and it, it's been a huge concern at every public meeting we've had. And so is there no way to get some kind of temporary lighting just to help alleviate that? I mean, three years seems like a long time to go without lighting to me. I think that'd be, that's a very good question. We could put um, these things were brought up in our discussion. Um, but we could definitely take a look at if it's motioned by the council to have make sure it's a temporary lighting source to make sure that the security lighting is acceptable in the, in the parking lot. Figure out some way to do that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Greg Lanting. Uh, I've used my laser in about a year, and so we only, <laughs> only made it through the first few seconds. Uh, the question I would have is the church parking lot that is adjacent to it. Has there been any? Now uh, there's he's showing it to me. Thanks, Bill. Uh, has there been any cross-use agreement conversations about possibly when they're not in use that the city could use it, and then because obviously they're going to spill over into ours when they have church. I'm assuming. Is any conversation? Probably that's maybe that's a yeah. question for Nathan. I don't know. I know it's been mentioned to me as far as the depth of those conversations. I don't know if, what that is, but I know those com some conversation took place. Part of it was to look at seeing if we could have a cohesive layout that incorporated that area. I do know that it didn't go so far as to include it in okay. our layout and, and approval. Okay. So Thank if, you. if there's any more information, appear it's not. Thank you, Father. All right. Any other questions for Jonathan? Seeing none, we will move on to the public input portion of the public hearing. We'll open that for anyone who wishes to speak on this issue. Please come forward. If you would please state your name and address for the record, please. Absolutely. My name is Bear Morton, 2670 East, 4256 North, and I'm the pastor at Venture Valley Bible Church. Um, just, just your last comment, uh, Mr. Landing. I haven't seen anything come across our desk as far as with the city wanting to maybe partner with that space use. We would be open to that. Um, yeah, we want to be a good friend, good neighbor. All that to say, uh, if you want to come and talk and we can try to figure out what's the best use of that, we'd love to do that. So just that input. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this issue before us? Seeing none, we will close the public input portion of the hearing and turn it over to the council for deliberation. Chris Talkington. I would move that we authorize the issuance of a special use permit for an open parking lot at the property described at 229 2nd Avenue North, Lot 6, 14, Block 85, Twin Falls Town Site, subject to the two attached conditions and uh, to add a third to explore and fund temporary lighting uh, on the um, permanently or the temporarily deferred project completion uh, parking lot. Second. A motion by Chris Toggenton, seconded by Suzanne Hawkins to approve the special use permit as presented with the two conditions plus a third condition that would require the exploration and potential installation of security lighting in advance of the I, I might need to amend this. That, uh, would that not be a URA funding, or would that be a city? Correct. The request is from the Urban Renewal Agency, not from the yeah, city. Yeah, it would be from the agency. We, I, I'm a pedestrian as much as anybody, and I would there is a way we could install it without having to go back and change a lot of the underground utilities and any additional costs. I we should do it if we're going to do it anyway. So let's. I'll talk to our board about that and see what's available. Okay. Is there any discussion from the council, Don Hall? So should we have that in the motion if it's not our under our authority to? So it's under your authority to create condition. certain conditions for that they those. have to do that. Yeah, what we're we've been sitting sidebarring, determining one of the questions we don't know 
is if the Urban Renewal Agency makes an investment in temporary power, would they be able to utilize that investment on the permanent solution? And that's just something that we don't know based upon the configuration and the layout. And I think what uh, Nate was talking about was determining whether or not um, the funds going forward would have a future cost. And if it's and if the agency can do it now, it's probably something that we would recommend if they could be incorporated into the permanent solution. But if it can't be, uh, the agency would be um, spending money that would ultimately be pulled out of the ground. I guess, um, I guess my question is, should it be in the motion then? Should, or should it be more of a, because um, the motion is a condition. That's that's the intent. That that's this true. Is a, an that's overriding city condition for public safety that we're imposing upon the URA. On, on the URA. How they do it. Move up to, to them. Suzanne Hawkins. Thank you. I'd just like to thank um, Pastor Bear for coming forward tonight and encourage city staff and URA to continue negotiations there because working with good partners is something we'd like to strive for. Further discussion from the council? So just to clarify that the motion is to approve the special use permit subject to the conditions of, hold on, <clears throat> to the site plan amendments as required by building engineering, fire, and zoning officials, and then to, um, to defer required improvements with the exception of lighting until the completion of the downtown Main Street Alley project proje projected for 2019 and that the lighting will be explored for installation now. Close enough. Greg Lanting. Well, I know we're in the discussion, but can I get the mayor's approval for one last question for, of, of uh, possibly the Magic Valley church person? Or is that not allowed? Sure. Okay. Well, could you come back up, sir? I didn't catch your name. I apologize. Bear. Bear okay. So you're reopening that. Yeah, so I'll reopen the public uh, public input portion you, of the Bear. hearing. I, I, I haven't been by there, so I don't know. Are, are, since the building is gone, are the billboards gone? or? No, the billboards are still there. Uh, okay. Lamar actually owns them, but we rent the, the space where the posts go in the ground. So okay. they give us a rental um, check for that little portion to put their signs up. I guess I was going to plant a seed that since those are still there, and that obviously there's electricity already there for those, because I believe they're lighted, aren't they? Uh, they are lighted. Okay, that maybe part of the temporary could be, uh, that would be later pretty permanent, would be placed on your property through your agreement that would actually provide some lighting for both sides in the meantime until... That way, I'm not. I'm not envisioning in my mind with his, with Mr. Talking this portion of the motion that there's going to be a full lighting like we would see in a tropical parking lot. We're talking temporary here that at least gives some security, is my thought. Uh, but I, I'm just planting a seed for maybe further conversations. Sure. Uh, just just to put some insight into that, Lamar owns. Their, they have their own designated power box there for their signs, mm -hmm. so they would have to get into discussion. Right. With the electricity, I'm, I'm assuming there's a the Idaho Power has a source of power to their to their meter that they can, other somebody That's else correct. could tap into. That's correct. Besides them, okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yep. So, are there any further questions for anybody? Well, I vote late. Okay. Well, so, <laughs> so we will we'll close that up again for the public input, and uh, if there's no further discussion on the motion, Chair, and roll call vote, please. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hawk? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. <clears throat>
Thank you, Nate. Uh, next on the agenda is a uh, request to adjourn into executive session under Idaho Code 74206-1B to consider the evaluation, dismissal, or disciplining of or to hear complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual agent or public school student. Council wishes. Suzanne Hodgins. Move approval of executive session 74-2061B. Second. Motion by Suzanne Hawkins, seconded by Don Hall to adjourn into executive session as stated. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Just to remind everyone, we will not be making any decisions while in executive session, nor will we be reconvening following the executive session. With that, we are adjourned.